Progressive overload. This is a very important training principle. One that is, I think, getting more attention now, which is great. And people are starting to understand it better and better, which is a fantastic thing. But I still think there's a lot of people who may not fully get what progressive overload is about. And hopefully uh, this section of the presentation will help you all with that. So when we want to increase fitness, that's going to require us to progressively overload the stimulus in training. So we need to think about what is an overloading stimulus? Well, it's a stressor to the body that forces a response. And that stressor needs to increase in a progressive manner, which means it has to be logical. So it needs to be deliberate to target those specific adaptations that we want, right? And it needs to be sequential, structured, and timely increases, okay? That's the progressive component of progressive overload. So we're just passing the, the term. Overload is the training stress. And this is where we need the stress to be disruptive enough to cause an adaptation and response. And it has to be within the adaptive potential of the system. So this is uh, where we need to think about there's a threshold and the stimulus needs to be above that threshold, but it can't be so high that it's outside your ability to adapt to it. And as it relates to resistance training, the stress of hard training will lead to a number of responses as we saw, which should increase our fitness in both the hardware and software adaptations. So the morphological and the neurological adaptations. So that's what overload is achieving. And some misconceptions about progressive overload are that progression has to occur on a week to week basis. It does not, and that's not how we apply the principle of progressive overload. Overload must surpass the prior stimulus for progress to occur. So for example, for you to make progress, if you've done three by 10, three sets of 10 at 100 kilos, you have to do three sets of 11 or 12 at 100 kilos for progress to occur. Not always true. Training hard is always overloading. Not always. You can be training hard, but not necessarily uh, be meeting the overload threshold. A good example of this would be if you're doing uh, F45. Um, you could be working really hard. You know, Psychologically, it's taxing, short rest periods. Are you pushing yourself? But if you're not increasing the weight that you're lifting, doing more reps, uh, then you're not really overloading training. You're working hard, but you're not overloading your training. And progress is always observable. Um, it is always going to be observed at some point, but it's not always observable when people expect it to be observed. Uh, and this is especially true for hypertrophy. So in reality, progressive overload is best defined as a stimulus sufficient for an adaptive response to occur. So it's within that range. So it's got to meet the threshold uh, to be stimulating and it needs to be within the uh, adaptive potential of the system. So there's a range of where the stimulus will provide a benefit to increasing your fitness. And as positive adaptations occur, so as you get fitter and fitter, as you build more muscle and get stronger, you need to overload your training so that you can keep pace with your increasing fitness levels. And that's all we need to think about when we apply progressive overload. So all else equal increases in performance and subsequently the stimulus are a direct result of prior adaptations. So we don't overload our training to get adaptations. We overload our training because we have adapted. And just the best way to think about progressive overload guys is that as we get better, we need to train better. So that's really, the best way and most simplest way I can summarize progressive overload. And we have a number of different progression models that we can use within our training programs. Uh, we have a single progression uh, where we change one variable at a time, keeping the others constant, where we add load or add sets or add reps. We have a double progression. The boys will cover this more in program design, so don't stress out. Uh, where we change two variables at a time whilst keeping others constant. So we'll progress reps first and then sets. Uh, or then load. Uh, triple progression, where we change three variables. So we progress reps, then sets, and then load. And a dynamic double progression, which is my favorite, which is where we're changing two variables at a time in a reactive manner. So we might have a rep range with a target RPE, and you can hit any rep number within that range at any load, provided you meet the RPE. And that way, over time, uh, progress will come to you very organically. So you'll just see you're doing more reps or you're lifting more weight uh, and it all unfolds uh, as it should. And this is where we need to think about progressive overload as being either reactive or proactive. 
So proactive overload is where we have a predetermined progression scheme, such as over this five week training cycle, I'm gonna add two and a half kilos every week to my squat. This probably isn't the best approach to applying overload because it doesn't take into account the highly varied and wild fluctuations that we see in an individual's neuro neurobiological backdrop. And what I mean by this is, if somebody has a shitty night's sleep or they're stressed out, they've had a fight with their significant other or they you know, have missed a few meals for a day, whatever the case may be, their performance is gonna be very predictable. And proactive or planning progression uh, in advance ahead of time can work with some people if they have a very consistent neurobiological backdrop. But if they don't, it's probably not a good thing. And I don't know many people who uh, have a very stable sort of uh, physiology that we can just predict, you know, over five weeks that their performance is going to be here, you know, in four or five weeks' time. It just doesn't work like that. So it's best to apply progressive overload reactively. So we, we only increase rep sets or load when necessary to ensure that we're maintaining or staying within uh, that adaptive uh, stimulus range. So the stimulus is still uh, overloading, it's passing the threshold and within the potential of uh, the individual's recovery uh, abilities. So progression should occur organically. So as adaptations take place, we increase uh, the stimulus so that we keep training hard, basically. And this is a, a good way to think about uh, comparing uh, a predetermined proactive overload versus reactive overload. So if the optimal stimulus, that blue band there, uh, blue checkered band, uh, that's the range. That's our adaptive range. Now, as you can see, if we have a predetermined overload, we say, yep, we're going to add two and a half kilos uh, week one, two, three, four, five, and six. Eventually, because we, we don't know where this adaptive uh, range sits or where the optimal stimulus lies, we might just overshoot it completely, or we might even fall under it. Who knows? Uh, and that's why we need to be measuring and monitoring so that we can adjust the training plot plan as necessary uh, to ensure that we're always staying as close as we can uh, to being within the optimal stimulus range. And it kind of uh, looks like this. So this is an example of uh, how we would apply reactive pressure. We would see volume load and performance, uh, you know, potentially increase over the course of the training cycle uh, where, you know, fatigue is going to get a little bit higher over the meso cycle, especially for hypertrophy programs. And that's where we need to make sure that we're adjusting the stimulus uh, based on the individual's fatigue level. So you can see the yellow there, th this individual's fatigue is rising and that's why their performance starts to flatline a little bit. Um, but if we just keep jacking up the stimulus, they're gonna reach a point where they start overtraining, uh, fatigue will be too high and their performance will just plummet. And that's not a good thing. So for strength, in the short term, we, when we progressively overload our training for strength outcomes, uh, we want to see expression of strength, that is dropping fatigue um, and showcasing our maximal fitness uh, capacity. Uh, and that's going to require adding load and generally decreasing reps and volume. And in the long term, progression for strength, as we know, is probably going to be best achieved by building muscle. And this increases our force production potential. So we can express fitness abilities later on uh, and we also need to consider developing proficiency and mastery of the specific lifts uh, that we want to be strong at. And that's motor learning, confidence and self-efficacy and muscle size. Now, progression for hypertrophy at a physiological level is to increase the tension stimulus in magnitude or duration or exposure so that we positively alter muscle protein synthesis. Um, and we need to keep pace with the increased uh, muscle size uh, so basically, we're going to need to add weight to the bar over time or at least be training harder and harder on average.